I think at the moment we're in a period of uh, extreme inflation and uh, we will continue to uh, uh, take some price through the rest of this year. Um, our plans beyond that are for much more moderated uh, pricing, but I don't think uh, we've seen the end of price increases from us. The concern is, is, is clearly, uh, has clearly increased and, um, and that will, of course, reduce uh, confidence. That will lead to some, at least some, some time in the coming quarters where we will expect to see uh, lower growth. We faced expected headwinds related to the continued slowdown in our online e-commerce vertical, which had grown quickly during the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as ongoing targeting and measurement challenges impacting advertising spend. We experienced a further deceleration in growth following the start of the Ukraine war due to the loss of revenue in Russia. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Friends with Facebook, Meta shares soar after hours as its social network returns to user growth. Twitter, Amazon, and Apple also report later today. Then, EU gas demands. While Ursula von der Leyen warns companies against paying for Russian gas in rubles, Germany is ready to back a ban on oil gradually from Moscow. Plus, eyes on earnings. Standard Chartered raises its revenue outlook. Unilever hikes prices as cost inflation bites and Barclay traders post a surprise jump in fig trading. Now, we have a lot of earnings to get through, so we'll get on to that very shortly. But this is a picture for the market. So we're seeing elevated European stock 600, uh, gaining some 1.1%. Of course, the focus in some of these earnings better than expected. Also, European stocks rallying after we had not only these updated earnings uh, trying to rally, I guess, some of their individual sectors, but we're also getting a bit of a lift from China. The one I would would watch out for is yen. You can see uh, dollar yen at 130. 130 is a huge psychological deal. It means, of course, that the divergence play between Japan and the rest of the world will continue. Interesting to hear Governor Kuroda again and again saying he will not lose track of what he's trying to do, not seemingly worried about inflation. That really goes a grain against the grain of every other central bank across the world, almost every other central bank. This is what the picture looks like for some of these European countries. So if we take a look at the individual resolve, for example, of Germany, but also, uh, you know, France and Italy, the main question like it was yesterday is what do they do with their dependence on Russia? A lot of these countries asking Brussels and the Commission to come up with a plan. Can they actually trade in rubles? Can they uh, pay for their gas in rubles or is that really against sanctions? So a bit of a, a going and throwing between them to see exactly what they can and can't do. We understand through our Bloomberg reporting that 10 European countries have opened accounts in ruble ready to pay for that if they were allowed to do so. This is a picture for pre-market in Meta. Meta, you know it's Facebook, but I like reminding you because we don't use a Meta platform. For the moment, we only use Facebook and their other platforms gaining 18.2%. This is giving a nice lift to a lot of the tech stocks after we had disappointing figures from Netflix and others the day before. Now, the EU is preparing its response to Russia's threat to cut off further gas supplies to Europe. Ursula von der Leyen warning companies not to bend to Moscow's demands to pay for gas in rubles, as that would be, she says, in breach of sanctions. Well, that's despite a Bloomberg News exclusive suggesting at least 10 European companies have set up ruble accounts. Well, joining us now are Europe correspondent Maria Tadeo. Maria, first of all, how do you square the two? There's also a lot of countries asking for a clarification on the commission of what they can't and can't do. Yeah, and the short answer, Francine, uh, right now it's, it's very difficult to square the two, and in many ways you can't. If you look at uh, the words yesterday from Ursula von der Leyen, the head of the commission, she says, follow our guidance, you only pay in euros, and if you don't, or you facilitate that payment in rubles, you could risk being in breach of European sanctions. And yet, yet, Francine, we know there's about 10 European companies that have already set up twin accounts, one in euros and a conversion in rubles, so that the gas continues to flow. I think there's two big issues, uh, Francine. One is the legal responsibility for this transaction. Does it end in the moment in which you pay in euros, or do you also hold responsibility over that conversion in rubles? In that case, you can see why there's breach of sanctions. Companies will tell you if Gazprom, however, is not sanctioned, then what is the problem? It is still connected to the SWIFT, and the European Union still uses it to find us those uh, transactions. Yeah. So, Francine, the European lawyers are going to be working over time with this, and we're about to hear from Ursula von der Leyen in about two hours' time. The idea is that she's going to provide some clarity, which at this point is very much needed. 
So, Maria, is this power move by Russia taking Europe closer to a full embargo? Where does Germany stand on this exactly? Yeah, and, and Francine, you know, there's two big school of thoughts right now. One that says at this point Russia's using this as a geopolitical weapon. The idea is that maybe it is time for the European Union to front run the Russians and do it first before the Russians uh, cut it off. Others who believe we can still wait for about three weeks. Remember, the other uh, big deadline coming up is mid-May, and at that point, perhaps, you have three weeks to revisit uh, this whole scheme of payments. But, Francine, what I can tell you is that this week we are expecting another package of sanctions. It would be the six that's been placed on the table. It would include or could include now a partial uh, embargo of oil. We're expecting this to be signed off by uh, Saturday. But of course, the big issue here is that it doesn't include gas. And at this point, as you can see very much, this is still a gas story. It certainly is a gas story. Maria, thanks so much. Uh, Maria, they our correspondent in Brussels. Now joining us is Massimo Di Odoardo. He's vice president of gas, of gas and LNG research at Wood Mackenzie. Massimo, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, first of all, if there was an oil or gas embargo tomorrow, and again, it's unclear that there's a million discussions on whether they can pay in ruble or not, what, how much um, energy does Europe have left? Well, not much, right? And yeah. it's very different between oil and gas, obviously. Yes. Um, so, so for gas, <clears throat> the issue that Europe has is that it cannot substitute all that Russian gas straight away. Right. It's as simple as that. For oil, obviously, there are alternatives, and that's because oil can be shipped and, uh, and eventually can, can, you know, Europe can get gas oil yeah. from elsewhere. So, Massimo, if you're Italy today, if you're Germany today, the countries that are most dependent on Russian gas, what kind of calculations do you do? I mean, the politicians and the companies have a really difficult task to make. Very difficult task, and, and you can see how different countries have responded, how difficult that task is, right? So you've heard, you've heard yesterday uh, OMV, so Austria and Germany no. willing to effectively yes. abide to this new payment uh, approach, and Italy on the other side taking its time to see whether there are options. But in reality, right, no. while again probably Austria and Germany really don't have any other option to substitute that Russian gas, Italy might think it as it, but we don't think actually that that is going to be something that they can do, at least in the short term. There's nothing, there's not like, is there some kind of agreement with Qatar that they can do and get the gas quickly? Can the U.S. and some gas, are there strategic reserves and gas that they can release? It takes time. Europe is How important. much time? Well, Europe's important as much LNG as it can <laughs> at the moment, right? Okay. For new supply to get developed, it takes between four and five years, right? So until 2025, possibly 26, more LNG supply in Europe compared to what we're seeing now, it's very unlikely. So is there anything that, that these countries can do in the next five to six months? Well, uh, I mean, I'm afraid for some of these countries, if there is an embargo of Russian gas, the only way is to cut demand, right? And different countries would have different exposures. So we've done some analysis at, at a European level. If Russia was going to cut supply just now, we think that eventually up to 10% of industrial, of industrial demand could be cut, right? Yeah. But, but the dynamic would be very different across different European markets, right? So Italy and Germany would certainly be the most affected, yeah. while on the other side, France and the UK might be less affected. But all of them would see extraordinary high prices, much higher than what we're seeing today. So, Massimo, I've seen a plan actually from Germany in some of the, you know, if you have to ration energy, so they, you know, have gone through sectors and say, yeah. right, this sector, for example, this part of the manufacturing, which we could do without, a little bit like what happened in COVID. Yeah. What, what would happen in Italy? And actually, do, do we really, is there a, a, a sector that actually needs a lot of gas that we could do without? Or is it, I mean, I know it's not as simple. Yeah, but I mean, you know, there, there are ceramics and manufacturing that, uh, you know, need quite a lot of gas, for example, yeah. and obviously are not, are not essential to, 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 to yeah. you know, to, 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 to the living. But, but nevertheless, you know, that results in uh, quite a lot of suffering in terms of GDP and industrial growth. So, yeah. so while there are ways to manage it, the implications of GDP could be quite dire. Yeah, and of course, as opposed to COVID, this is something that is self-imposed by some of the government. So what do you think they'll end up deciding? Will some of these companies, I mean, I know I think one of the Italian companies also set up an account to be able to yeah. pay in rubles. You know, again, I think, I think what you will see, it's really dependent on how countries and company can deal with our, without Russian gas. Again, you, Italy perhaps has a bit more leeway compared yeah. to Germany and Austria, at least at the moment. Uh, and so you might see some companies try and do something, right? Yeah. But again, Edison, for example, as a contract that expires at the end of this year, they might decide to give that away. But any still imports yeah. more than 20 yeah. BCM of gas from Russia. We think it's unlikely that they'll be able to do anything but just pay, uh, pay, you know, go, go with these payments. So what do you think Germany will do? I mean, Germany, you know, wasn't against, this is an oil embargo yesterday, but this, that it has to be very gradual. Yeah.
Yeah, exactly. I think, I think Germany is, in, is in perhaps in an even worse position than, than Italy because, again, it's different, it's less optionality. So, and I think they've signaled that, right? If you hear what they said today, they seem to be keen to uh, abide with this payment. Again, the idea is that this payment, the payment in double euros and rubles, doesn't breach right. eventually uh, sanctions. And, uh, and that's what they'll have to do, unfortunately. Massimo, thank you so much for joining us. Massimo thank Di you. Odoardo there, Vice President of Gas and LNG Research at Wood Mackenzie. Now, coming up, friends with Facebook, Meta shares soar after hours as its flagship social network returns to user growth. The revival offers, well, Wall Street optimism that its earlier decline was a blip. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's get straight to some earnings news. We have so many earnings today. Meta Platforms reported after the bell, dispelling concern of user saturation on the legacy Facebook platform. Now the results calmed investor nerves following Alphabet's results, which were dragged down by YouTube. While well, Bloomberg's Laura Wright joins us with the very latest. Laura, there's a bright spot. Not everything is dead in tech. Exactly a bright spot, a real relief for investors. And we're still seeing meta platforms surging in the pre market up almost 18%. Well, look, Francine, a lot of the headwinds were already priced in. Competition from TikTok, the platform that the Gen Z kids and Francine Lacqua like to use, the war in Ukraine, those Apple privacy changes that make it harder for advertisers to acquire data. Yes, average revenue per user was low, the lowest since the third quarter of 2020, but meta platforms, they're trying to push advertisers toward Reels, their short-form video competitor to TikTok and millennials Millennials are back, an increase of 31 million in the first quarter daily average users, dispelling concerns that the legacy platform is dying. Now, looking forward to the future, Reels will remain in focus. And we heard a lot about that on the earnings call from the CFO, Cheryl Sandberg. She calls it a multi-year journey. The metaverse, how much will it cost? How long will it take? Mark Zuckerberg gave us a little bit of insight. He said it could be 10 years until all that investment turns profitable. The Oculus Gaming headset, headset was received well when it was released last year. And this year, we'll see the workplace virtual reality headset. So we might be in a very different working environment before we know it, Francine. Yes, Oculus. Although a lot of people get queasy actually looking at Oculus. Maybe, you know, holograms are the way forward. Laura, thank you so much. Laura, right there with Facebook and Metaverse's 10-year journey. Now, we're joined by Patrick Spencer. He's vice chairman of equities at Bear. Patrick, great to speak to you and great to have you here in the studio. All right. Are we going to speak by holograms. Do you like any of the tech stocks or are they just too expensive right now? Oh, morning, friends. Good morning. It's <laughs> lovely to be back physically in the building. It is nice, isn't After it? After being in my office in, in the country for the last two years. Forget all this Oculus stuff. Yeah, we want real conversations. Real conversations. So uh, I think our view is, uh, you know, we've been a little bit cautious on markets this year. We're very selective about technology. It's been beaten up pretty badly. As you know, Nasdaq's down about you know, 12% this month. <laughs> Um, so we focus on really the areas of um, you know, technology that excite us. Mm -hmm. You know, digitization, Which, digitization yeah. is basically ain't going away. It's a secular yeah. trend. But, you know, within that, you know, we like security. Mm -hmm. uh, we like the Internet of Things. We like, uh, you know, artificial yeah. uh, intelligence and, and, and the cloud. And I think those have been borne out by the recent earnings and yeah. where you've seen performance and, and weakness. Patrick, what, I can, what I'm concerned about when yeah. I look at digitization is that if you're not in the digital world, you're going to lose now, aren't you? Mm. So how do you play digitization? Is it more getting rid of the sectors that are just not keeping up or the companies that are just a little bit, you know, boomer style? Yeah, it's a great question because, you know, within that is, you know, you've got a Fed that's actually raising rates at the moment. And, you know, that lovely adage, the first thing I learned when I came into the city 30 years ago is don't fight the Fed. So you've got, you know, basically QE going to QT. So price, you know, price to sales companies now, which are under pressure, you know, they've actually got to learn how to innovate and, yeah. and, and basically actually turn themselves into free cash flow machines. Yeah. So a lot of the smaller mid-size uh, growth companies have been mm -hmm. crushed. 
you know, something like I think 40% of the NASDAQ stocks are down 50% this year. So you've got to be selective where you choose that. So ours predominantly are, are, are big tech companies within those areas that I talked about. But Patrick, when did you, I don't, when did you start? Yeah. Just a couple of years ago, right? I mean, <laughs> don't fight the Fed. Now it's the yeah. Fed saying don't fight the markets yeah. because they seem so dependent to yes. how markets react. It's almost like they don't have the guts to go and deal with inflation. Sure. Well, it, um, you know, certainly we see 50 basis point increases next week. We see another 50 basis point actually uh, increases in June. We look for two and three quarters, three percent by year yeah. end. So that's aggressive and that takes you out of neutrality and that takes yeah. you into worries about recession. And that's what I'm saying, so, don't fight the Fed. You've got to be <laughs> very careful of which stocks you buy. And that's why yeah. you've seen all this volatility yeah. at the moment. So how much more volatility are you expecting? And that brings you, what, about 3.25 yeah. by year end? Yes, we're, we're looking for about 3% by, by, by year end. Yes. You see, I still got it. I can still you know. calculate <laughs> just about. Fantastic, yeah. Um, so, well, you've seen, I mean, this year alone, you were with QT, I think 75% uh, of the market this yeah. year on the trading days have seen more than 1%. You know, yeah. compared to QE, that was completely, you know, actually, yeah. you know, it, it, it was so, you know, it, there were the VIX was very, very mm -hmm. low. Um, so, yes, I think the volatility will increase. Mm -hmm. That's why you've got to be so careful because the key, we believe, is peak inflation. Right. And at Baird, we believe peak inflation comes in the second half of the year. Does it? And if, if, That's if, bold. If it is bold uh, because some of this inflation could be durable. Yeah. So if we see peak inflation in the second half of the year, that means we expect maybe lower rates but better earnings. And therefore, okay. some of these growth stocks risk on could be interesting. Okay, Patrick, hold that thought because I want to talk yeah. a lot more about peak inflation in the second half of the year. Pretty optimistic. Patrick Spencer, Vice Chairman of Equities at Baird, stays with us. Coming up, we'll get more on the markets as NASDAQ futures jump, yen drop, shakes up currencies. Well, we'll continue our conversation with Patrick Spencer. This is Bloomberg. finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, upbeat corporate earnings in Europe are bolstering the bull case for the economy and the markets. Despite this, China's COVID outbreak, the war in Ukraine and recession risks still weigh on investor sentiment. We're back with Patrick Spencer. He's vice chairman of equities at Barrett. Patrick, you had this like huge, bold call. You're expecting a lot of the inflationary pressures, and I don't know how many, if it comes from energy or elsewhere, to actually slow down in the second half. So if the Fed is too aggressive, if central banks in general too aggressive because it could it lead to a policy reversal and therefore a policy mistake uh, yes it could but you've got to bear in mind uh, that the market basically central bankers follow the markets yeah and the markets are telling you um, look you've got mortgages at five percent which are up yeah. from two percent you've got the 10-year at uh, you know you've got the you know you, you've got the 10-year at uh, you know one and whatever mm -hmm. it is 170 mm -hmm. down from 190 and some of the shorter end of the market. So the market's already telling you yeah. that it's, uh, it's, it's going to increase rates. So the market already ha has, has been doing yeah. its work and you're beginning to see a slow a slowdown mm -hmm. in, in general economies. And the Fed, uh, it, may, it may talk hawkish, yes. but I think it will be more dovish. Right. But you've got, uh, you know, you've got a 100% you know, deficit to GDP in the US. Yeah. And every 1% move um, in rates costs you something like 240 billion. Yeah. So there's a huge influence actually you know, on the government to finance that. But is that, Patrick, because you know, the, there's a tightening of financial conditions without yeah. the Fed actually having to do much? And again, yeah. what does that mean for, for sectors you want to be invested in in sure. the US? Yes, no, it's a, it, it's a very good question. If you look at the earnings that have just actually been reported, you know, despite all the things we've just been talking about today, you know, 80% of the companies actually have, have beaten earnings uh, this quarter, or 30% of the S&P have reported, and there's sort of 80%. We as a firm have been quite cautious this year because, you know, we were concerned about rising rates and don't fight the Fed. And, you know, we've been more uh, cautious in buying things like right. utilities, REITs, yep. um, energy stocks, um, you know, those types of, you know, staples, defensive names. But we're now beginning to warm a little bit right. more aggressively to pro-growth. So the technology stocks on a specific basis, some of the discretionary stocks. And the recent earnings have shown that basically, you know, the consumer 
is, 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 is still strong. Yeah, but to uh, what point? So I had a good conversation yeah. actually with the Unilever chief executive, yeah. and they've managed to increase sales by increasing prices. Sure. At some point, when inflation really starts to bite, then they'll just switch brands to, to cheaper ones. Yes. No. And I guess for you, it's, it's catching that falling knife. Yes. Or not catching that falling knife. Yeah, no, that, that's, that, that's also a very good question. But from the US earnings so far, what we've seen is that premium brands, people who actually are paying up from no. that. You know, the consumer had a trillion dollars of savings prior to uh, COVID. It's now got three trillion. You know, there's no. almost full employment in the US. So the consumer's feeling pretty good. And the recent mm. consumer earnings has actually proved that they continue to spend. So until we go into recession, I think pricing can still be absorbed by the consumers. Patrick, thank you so much for joining us today. Patrick Spencer, the Vice Chairman of Equities at Baird. Coming up, a crypto mining company, Argo Blockchain, says it's seen a 291% increase in revenue in its full year results. We speak to the chief executive next. We'll also have a full roundup of markets. We look at Yuan, we look at Yen and the Bank of Japan. This is Bloomberg. with Facebook, Meta shares soar after hours as its social network returns to user growth. Twitter, Amazon and Apple report later today. EU gas demander Slovan Jalein warns companies against paying for Russian gas in rubles. Germany is ready to back a ban on oil from Moscow. And eyes on earnings. Standard Chartered raises its revenue outlook. Unilever hikes prices as cost inflation bites. And Barclays traders post a surprise jump in fig trading. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the markets tell us a story, a story that earnings are not as bad as expected. Certainly, we also have a nice lift thanks to what we saw over in Facebook earnings. Now, also the Bank of Japan uh, sparking the sharp slide in the yen by doubling down on its promise to defend a rock bottom yield target. And that really leaves it as a dovish outlier as other major central banks do it elsewhere. This is a picture for yen, 130.72. And elsewhere, you can see the NASDAQ futures are also gaining some 2.3%. Meta or Facebook elevated in pre-market trade. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news, here's Leanne Gerens. Hi Leanne. Hi Francine. EU President Ursula von der Leyen has warned companies not to give in to Russia's demand to pay for gas in rubles. European firms have been scrambling to respond after Moscow cut off gas to Poland and Bulgaria. Bloomberg has learned Italian energy giant Eni is preparing to open ruble accounts at Gazprom Bank as it seeks guidance on whether it can can actually use them. Now cities across China are rolling out measures aimed at keeping COVID flare-ups at bay and avoiding the hardships endured by Shanghai. Hangzhou, an e-commerce hub, a short train ride away from Shanghai, has started a mass testing drive, joining the capital Beijing and trying to eliminate outbreaks before they do spiral out of control. China is now near the bottom of the latest Bloomberg COVID resilience ranking. The Bank of Japan has sparked a sharp slide in the yen by doubling down on its promise to defend a rock bottom yield target. The central bank said it would buy an unlimited amount of bonds at fixed rates every business day. That is as the BOJ supports its 0.25% ceiling on government debt yields as part of its stimulus measures. And Bill Wang has pleaded not guilty to fraud and other charges from the collapse of his family office and will be freed on a $100 million bail the founder of Archegos Capital Management agreed to pay over $5 million in cash and also pledged two properties, including his own personal home, to secure his bond. He is facing 11 charges, including racketeering conspiracy, market manipulation, wire fraud and also securities fraud. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 100. 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, the crypto mining company.
company Argo Blockchain says it's seen a 291% increase in revenue in its full year results. Now, that was supported by China's exit from the mining industry, which saw a temporary drop in the computing power required to mine Bitcoin. Argo's focus now turns to significantly expanding its mining capacity in Texas. Well, we're delighted to be joined by the Argo Blockchain chief executive. He's Peter Wall. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Talk to us a little bit about these hash rates, which, hash rates, which is basically the cost of powering computers with energy prices up how much more difficult and how much more expensive is it to mine yeah it's a good question francine obviously you know to be a miner in, in the crypto world and in, in the bitcoin mining world you need three things you need power you need machines you need capital so obviously the, the effect of energy that the cost of power is, is going to have a big impact on on miners fortunately most miners that are set up in various places around the world are set up in industries or, or rather in locations where power is cheap, where prices are locked in. So I think in the short term, the cost of energy is not really going to affect miners uh, in, in a huge way. Right. But I think in the long term, uh, obviously, miners need to always move to where power is really inexpensive. We're setting up in Texas right now. We don't anticipate having, uh, you know, the cost of power yeah. having a huge impact uh, on, on our, 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 our work there. Uh, but obviously, it's something that we watch closely. But Peter yeah, and actually, I mean, we've just hired one of the most wonderful reports on cryptocurrency. She's Emily Nicole, and we were talking about, you know, some of what will happen in Texas. And she was reminding me that basically the number of power required because of all of the miners wanting to move to Texas is equivalent to twice uh, New York City and how much it powers. So they want to increase by six gigawatts the power used to mine. This is for the state of Texas. Overall, about 17 gigawatts would be needed. So, again, what does it mean for a company like Argo Blockchain? Well, Texas is interesting. You know, there's 100 gigawatts of power on the, the particular grid there. It's an energy island. It's not connected to the rest of, uh, of, of the national grid. And so there's, mm -hmm. there's no shortage of power in Texas. Six gigawatts uh, it will not have a big impact overall. In fact, there's more than that that's coming online. There's about 20 gigawatts that's coming online in solar power in Texas just in the next two years. Um, so miners can play an important role, particularly in a, in a place like Texas, in a jurisdic jurisdiction like Texas where uh, there's a, a lot of renewable power. Miners can help stabilize yep. the grid, can, can turn their power off. It's one of the, the very few right. large load, load users that could turn power off yeah, but and Peter, give power back to the grid. I mean, there was a big storm. You know, I keep on being told that, you know, one of the big questions is what will miners do when demand outstrips supply? But in, in general, what are you expecting out of U.S. regulation later this year? What does it mean for mining companies and Bitcoin in general or all cryptocurrencies? Yeah, so listen, I, I think, you know, regulation is, is coming to, to the world of crypto. We, we've seen it kind of, uh, you know, coming in stages. And I think it depends on which jurisdiction you're in. Obviously, there's, there's places like China, which have been very he heavy-handed uh, on their approach to mining. There's just places like Texas, which have been very open. You know, we mine also in Quebec, where uh, they have very clearly set what the, what the guardrails are for, for miners, and we work within those guardrails, and, and that makes sense. And part of that is what we just talked about, curtailment, giving a certain amount of power back to the, to the grid when it's very cold, when power is needed elsewhere. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think in, in the United States, the approach that they're taking is a pro-innovation approach. They've, they've said, listen, we're going to set some guardrails. Uh, those are coming, right. but we don't want to hold back innovation. And I, I think that's the right approach. Uh, Peter, as a UK company, is there any appetite to actually support some of the mining over here? Listen, miners are always going to move to where the, the power is cheapest. So you've got some places in, in you know, the, the northern part of, of England, in Scotland, where there's low-cost wind power. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, but it's still going to be more expensive than other parts of, of the world. Uh, so likely it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a few years before we see any mining happening at scale. Um, it, 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 Texas is such an attractive place right now because of the, the grid, because of the amount of power that's there. So we're focused on Texas for now. Um, there's other parts of, of North America where you're seeing lots of growth. Some folks are moving to South America. Uh, the European market is there. Some parts of Scandinavia, there's some yeah. mining happening. Uh, for the most part, most, most, mining, most mining growth right now is happening in North America. Um, Peter, given mines don't really create a lot of jobs, do you have a lot of questions from you know, politicians or you know, governors and states where you are, who's the beneficiary of this? Is it really a worthwhile use of energy? Well, I, I think 
mines do create jobs in rural areas. We're working in Dickens County. You know, there's 3,000 people in that county. We're, we've hired 40 people in that region or from that region. That is a big impact for a community of 3,000 people. So if you, if you go and you speak to the judge in Dickens County, for instance, he's very happy to have us there because there's not a lot of industry that's happening in that particular part of the state. Um, so, and, and what we've seen in, in you know, in, in other parts of, of the world, like where we're operating in Quebec, we have, we've had a similar experience in, in, a, in a smaller community there. Uh, and then in terms of, you know, being able to, to be a stabilizer for the grid, to use some of the power uh, that most of the time is available. Um, I think a lot of large jurisdictions are, are recognizing that, uh, that mining can, can have a lot of benefits for, for communities large and small. Um, Peter, also your 2021 revenue jump was, of course, supported by China's exit from the mining industry. What is revenue looking like without that added benefit going forward? Yeah, I think revenue is strong. I mean, mining margins are still very, very good. Uh, you know, we've been putting out our numbers since, you know, since the China ban. They, they've continued to be strong. Uh, our mining margin for, for the first quarter of this year was, was in the 70s that, that we've been putting out. So I think it's still a very profitable business. Obviously, 2021 was a remarkable year. You had the China ban, as you mentioned. You had the price of Bitcoin. Um, network hash rate continues to go up. That's just part of part of the story with Bitcoin mining. So you need to be in the upper tier of efficiency. Uh, you need to be in, in the right place for, for power costs. Um, but it's still a very profitable business. Peter, thank you so much. Peter Walder, the Chief Executive Officer of Argo Blockchain. Now, coming up, we'll have Thanks, plenty Tracy. more on some of these earnings. Thank you. DNB Bank reporting net income for the first quarter. That beat the average estimates. We speak to the Chief Executive. She's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, Norway's DNB has reported net income for the first quarter that beat the average analyst estimates. Surging oil prices, a strengthening Norwegian economy, and a margin uplift from rate hikes are all contributing to improved prospects at the country's largest financial services group. Where I'm delighted now to be joined by DNB's chief executive, Kirsten Bratten. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. I have uh, many questions on some of your priorities, which are, uh, Ms. Bratten, of course, trying to give loans to small and medium-sized enterprises. How worried are you that they will be slammed by inflationary pressures and so that would affect your bottom line? Uh, we find the development and the trend across the uh, corporate sector and, and also very much in the uh, SME sector to be very strong and uh, a vast majority of the companies are actually looking to invest and grow and are looking to hire more uh, people. Our portfolio is robust and solid. We do not see any signs of growing prices and inflation as of yet, uh, but there can, of course, be more company-specific situation as we move ahead. I would like to highlight, though, that despite uh, a slight growth in inflation in Norway, it's a very different situation compared to what we see in the U.S. and many European countries. Core inflation in Norway as of March was 2.1 percent. Uh, uh, also, looking forward, uh, we are expecting somewhat higher level, but are still at levels that we can uh, define as comfortable uh, and in line with the long-term targets of the central bank. So, uh, talk to us a little also about risk management revenues. They seem to be pretty uh, strong in the quarter. Do they really talk to a shift in that trend because of all the market volatility? Was a strong target. It was a strong quarter in uh, risk management, uh, and we have been well positioned in relation to the volatility and the large volumes that have been traded in the Norwegian kroner, as well as well as the movement in the interest rates. Uh, we uh, the revenue from risk management will fluctuate from quarter to quarter. They are at the higher level than we deem to be normalized this quarter, but is positively impacted and there are more opportunities when there's a high level of volatility in, in the markets as we've seen in the past quarter. But is this a proper shift actually in the operating operating environment for banks and will this continue? I think we have a very limited activity within risk management. We uh, only take positions primarily uh, related to the Norwegian kroner and the Norwegian 
interest rate and the trading uh, risk management activity as such is not a large part of our uh, business. So uh, higher volatility tends to lead to more opportunities uh, than, than a more stable market. We have seen higher volatility, might see that going forward, but we do not see this as a material shift in the business of the group overall. Um, talk to me a little bit about the IPO market. So actually you bucked the trend. There was not a decline because of some specific IPO markets that you were involved with. How do you expect that moving forward? We have seen the IPO market uh, slowing uh, during the quarter, as you hear from all institutions across all markets. Despite that, we had a record earnings in our investment banking uh, division uh, because the slowing in the IPO market was more than compensated for by a very high activity in M&A uh, and uh, also some activity in, in the debt capital market. Uh, we do not see any projects yet being cancelled. It's more a fact of projects being postponed well into the future. So depending on the, the outlook, uh, that will determine uh, if and when this market again will, uh, will pick up. But uh, in all, I think we benefit from having diversified our investment banking activity across okay. geographies and across products, making it more resilient towards market volatility. The Norwegian Central Bank is raising rates like a lot of central banks around the world. So that's benefiting banks, I guess, such as yourself. What does it mean for shareholder return this year? Uh, it's very positive for uh, banks in general and us when uh, the rates are increasing. More particularly, I'd highlight that it's important why the central bank is hiking rates. And in, in Norway, the central bank is hiking rates on the back of a very healthy economic development and a very high level mm -hmm. of, uh, of activity. Uh, we uh, have not guided specifically on the impact, but so far we have uh, on three occasions raised rates as a consequence of the central bank hiking the key policy rate and have uh, highlighted that the historical impact of each of these have been an annual impact of between 1.2 to 1.5 billion uh, kroner. Uh, we cannot guide to the future, but those are the historic uh, numbers showing the impact. Thank you so much for joining us, Kristen Bratten there, the Chief Executive Officer of DNB. Now we'll have plenty more, of course, on some of these bank earnings, but now let's get straight to your Bloomberg Business Flash with Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine, and some more earnings. Facebook's main social network added more users than projected in the first quarter, sending shares soaring after hours. Meta platforms reported almost 2 billion daily users for its flagship platform, signaling a return to growth after the first ever decline in the December quarter. The social media giant had been losing momentum as a new generation flocks to sites like TikTok. Now, Samsung has reported a surge in first quarter profit on strong sales of memory chips and premium smartphones. Net income at the South Korea giant increased more than 50% in the period, well ahead of estimates. However, in the earnings call, the company warned about the potential impact of the war in Ukraine, surging inflation and COVID lockdowns in China. And Qualcomm shares have surged in late trading after giving a strong sales forecast for the current quarter. The company is the biggest maker of chips that do run smartphones. Qualcomm's revenue forecast came in ahead of estimates, helping dispel fears that chip demand is slowing after a pandemic fueled surge. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash, Francie. I like that pandemic fueled surge. Thank you, uh, Leanne, with all the latest business news. Now, coming up, Unilever posts strong first quarter sales growth. We hear from its chief executive next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, this is what the markets are looking at. A bit of support for earnings. Some of them better than expected. We had a good result, from example, from Unilever, where they were able to pass on some of these inflationary pressures. The one thing I would really look into is, of course, what's happening with Japan and what's happening with yen. Look at that. 130 versus a dollar. This is a huge psychological level. And, of course, it 
goes to the policies that Governor Kuroda has very well explained. He will not turn and follow all the other central banks in raising rates. Now, Unilever has also reported underlying sales for the first quarter that beat the average analyst estimate. The consumer goods giants warns that raw material inflation will be worse in the second half because of the war in Ukraine, weighing on profitability. We are seeing inflation across uh, basically all input costs, agricultural commodities, petrochemical derived materials, freight, distribution, energy, labor. And uh, the, therefore, the majority of uh, the sector's growth and our growth is coming from pricing. At the moment, we're not seeing down trading, but one of Unilever's strengths is we have a portfolio that typically offers a good, better, best alternative in each category. And so... We cover that risk a little bit by having um, offerings at the lower price points for uh, people who are feeling the pinch from inflation these days. Yeah. So is it changing consumer habits? Can you, do you see any patterns of people buying maybe some of the more expensive, premium, but also much more of, of the cheaper offerings? Uh, well, we're very sensitive to the pressure that household budgets are under right now. And you're quite right, we're seeing both things happening. There is up trading going on as people treat themselves to a, a little luxury um, when they uh, don't have the ability to invest, for example, in a holiday or a new durable good, um, but also some down trading. And the down trading that we've seen has been particularly in Latin America and a little bit in Europe. Uh, overall, though, uh, in the world, we're not seeing huge uh, shifts in consumption other than uh, people uh, obviously having to carry the inflationary costs that are being passed through. So how much more do you think inflation can go up? And again, what does it mean for your input costs? Yeah, uh, um, we had uh, guided a, uh, one quarter ago that we saw input costs uh, for the year uh, increasing for Unilever by 3.6 billion euros. We've now upped that estimate to 4.8 billion euros for the year. Uh, we're largely covered uh, now on those costs. So uh, how long do you think you can put prices up for? Well, you know, I, I think at the moment we're in a period of uh, extreme inflation and uh, we will continue to uh, uh, take some price through the rest of this year. Um, our plans beyond that are for much more moderated uh, pricing, but I don't think uh, we've seen the end of price increases from us or other players uh, in the industry for 2022. Well, Unilever Chief Executive there, Alan Jope, speaking to me a little bit earlier on shares currently a touch lower. Let's also look at what we're seeing pre-market for Meta. This is the parent company of Facebook yesterday coming in with some earnings that were certainly supported uh, after we had a bit of a disaster with some of the other uh, tech companies that made a lot of traders worry about tech valuations. Now, this is today's trading session. The Stocks Europe 600 index rising more than 1%. I'm looking at every industry groups. And for the moment, it's in the green. If you look at the big individual contributors, Total Energy, Glencore, but also Capgemini, they all posted gains on pretty good earnings. If you look at what we saw in terms of earnings, almost 70% of companies in Europe are due to publish results today. 61% of the companies so far that have reported have beaten estimates. So that's a nice little size and scope figure that we'll delve a little bit deeper into. And then finally, yen sliding to the closely watched level of 130 per dollar while the U.S. currency, the dollar, extending an advance. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller and Kay Lines are in New York. Our Anna Edwards is here in London. And this is a Bloomberg. We actually think that there might not be a technical recession, uh, but there could be negative quarters of growth. Um, Q2 is going to be very weak globally. This year is a battleground between uh, Fed pivoting, a negative, and the positive, the continuation of good corporate fundamentals. I don't think uh, we've seen the end of price increases from us or other players. The question you should ask yourself is, what it, where can I find safety in the world? This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines.
It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Thursday, April 28. Our top stories today. The dollar gets another boost as the Bank of Japan doubles down on bond purchases and the yen falls. The BOJ's move sending ripples through the FX world. Shares of meta platforms are soaring. Facebook's main social network added more users than projected in the first quarter. Up next, Twitter, Amazon and Apple take the spotlight. And Bill Wang's wild ride through the markets. Prosecutors say the Archegos capital billionaire had a rapid rise and fall in wealth unlike anything Wall Street has ever seen. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Chrissy Gupta and Kaylee Lines in New York. Matt Miller is off today. And Kaylee, once again, we see the fight back of corporate earnings and pricing power this quarter. Absolutely, and that is definitely giving a helping hand to the equity market, Anna, although arguably the story in FX really is more exciting. When it comes to Asian equities, though, broadly it was an update. One of the outperformers actually was Chinese technology stocks after China's state council pledged to support the growth of internet companies and also give some handouts to poor unemployed people really trying to shore up the economy as it deals with COVID zero policy. As a result, the Hang Seng Tech Index was up about 2%, but your other, other leadership in the equities uh, space was Japan. The Nikkei 225 is up about one and three quarters of a percent. And of course, that has everything to do with the weaker Japanese yen. In fact, the weakest Japanese yen we have seen going all the way back to 2002. We have broke above the 130 level on dollar yen for the first time in two decades. And of course, that is after the BOJ really doubled down on its devish stance with the continuation of that unlimited bond buying program. So that is weighing on the yen. And in result of that, it is also weighing on the Chinese yuan weaker against the dollar by about about nine tenths of one percent, six sixty four forty eight is where we trade, Creedy. So really, it's the ripples across the FX market that have our attention this morning. Yeah, and a ripple from the Asian market to the U.S. session as well. That risk on sentiment that you just highlighted, Kaylee, it is showing up in futures trading. The S and P five hundred futures up one point eight percent, a very strong bounce back. Remember, we did have seen at almost three percent sell off on Tuesday. So to see this kind of reversal, largely technical, but still largely driven also by those haven flows, and of course, what we're seeing with Meta earnings largely driving the flows into the United States. The 10 year yield, not a ton of movement, but Kaylee, I think you're 100 percent right in terms of the FX movements. It's all about the stronger dollar hitting a 20 year high. A lot of it driven by what's going on in, in the Japanese yen, that weakness that has persisted and weakness in the euro, the pound uh, as well. The question here is what does that do to those interest rate differentials? What does that do to the export picture, Anna? And of course, we can't forget Bitcoin as well, up one and a half percent, but put that in the context, context of volatility, not a huge move yet. And of course, we're going to keep mm. an eye on that for any more volatility. Anna. Yeah, movement in FX markets, certainly a feature of the European session. More on that in a moment. Let's have a look at where we are on the European equity markets. And this is what I meant by the fight back for equity uh, reporting and the corporate earnings story that we've seen this quarter, because we certainly saw banking uh, names and also names within the car sector producing good earnings today. And all of that lifting sentiment across European equities, it would seem in particular in those areas that were flashing bright green in France and in Germany. Uh, this is the FX move of interest here in Europe, because of course, the, the the yen dominating things through the Asia session, but really interesting to watch what's going on in Sweden. Just a few months ago, we heard from the Riksbank that there would not be a rate hike in Sweden until 2024. Things have moved very quickly on the inflation front, and we got a rate hike today and a signal of more rate hikes to come. Hence the big move that we're seeing in Euro Swedish Krona as the Swedish Krona gains. This is the corporate earnings story at Barclays. Better than anticipated numbers coming through in the investment banking side and also some market share gains on prime brokerage, helping to distract from the over issuance of exchange shaded notes, which had been such a theme and such a worry going into this uh, particular earnings report from this business. Volvo Cars also pleasing with its quarterly earnings and also the comments that it's given around pricing power and the normalization it expects to see in supply chains to some extent anyway in the second half of the year. Albioma, this is a French business that operates in the solar and biomass space, really, uh, uh, of course, at the center of the uh, transition within the energy sector. It's received a bid from KKR and as a result, a little bit of M&A to sprinkle across that sector. Also technology getting a bit of an M&A boost here in Europe as well, as well as the read across from those meta numbers. On to Russia and Russia, Russian assets. We'll talk more about the gas uh, conversation as we go through the program. But Kaylee, that really is the focus for the ruble right now. Uh, Russia still wants payments in rubles. And it seems to all come down to when do you judge your payments who have been made? Is it when those euros get to Gazprom Bank or is it when they turn into, uh, into rubles at the other end? A lot to talk about on that front, something we'll pick up a couple of times during this program. Yeah, we're all still seeking clarity 
on what exactly those rules are, Anna, and we'll continue to look for updates on that throughout the day today. As for what else we'll be watching in the day ahead, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will be testifying to the House Foreign Affairs Committee on priorities and the budget. Then we'll get some economic data. U.S. GDP is due at 8.30 a.m. New York time. I know Creedy's watching that one. And, of course, we all will be watching mega cap tech earnings that continue after the bell. The spotlight today on Amazon, Apple, and Twitter, Anna. Absolutely. If a tech focus continues then for us. Let's get back to the macro, though, because as you rightly say, Kaylee, this was a really fascinating story through the Asia session and continues to have an effect now. Onto the dollar, getting a fresh boost from a dovish bank of Japan today. The yen tanked beyond 130 for the first time since 2002. Let's get more with Bloomberg's Christine Aquino, who joins me on set here in uh, London. And, and Christine, uh, incredible moves in, in dollar yen, and it really hasn't stopped down by 1.9% for the Japanese currency. Absolutely, Anna. And that is very much a factor of what we saw from the Bank of Japan today doubling down on that dovish policy and really putting them at the opposite end of the spectrum as the Fed. Here we have two central banks are kind of doing opposite things. The Bank of Japan on the one hand really saying that they're going to keep supporting the market. They're going to keep doing their bond buying process. And the Fed on the other hand expected to raise by 50 basis points next week. And so we'll see if they deliver. But certainly that's really doing a number on dollar yen. That's where we're seeing this differential between the two currencies uh, really powering higher today. Also in the bond market playing out as well that differential between the 10 year Japan and Treasury yield also widening along with the currency cross. Certainly something we're going to be keeping our eye on throughout the session. Bloomer's Christine Aquino, thank you so much. Let's switch over to the tech space. Facebook's main social network added more users than projected in the first quarter. This helped to dampen concerns. The company is losing ground to apps like TikTok. CEO Mark Zuckerberg spoke on the company's earnings call yesterday. I think that the cycle here between investment and um, you know, meaningful enough revenue growth to be near or, or very profitable is going to be it's going to be long. Um, I think it's going to be longer for Reality Labs than for a lot of the traditional software that we've built. And on that subject, let's get more with Bloomberg's, Bloomberg's Laura Wright. Laura. Millennials are fighting back, Critty. Facebook, the legacy platform, it's not dead and buried. In fact, an increase, 31 million users, daily average users for the first quarter, dispelling concerns of declining user growth that we saw last quarter. Now, a lot of the headwinds were already priced in, the war in Ukraine, those Apple privacy changes, competition from TikTok. Executives at Meta, they want to push advertisers toward Reels, their short-form video competitor to TikTok. Right now, about 20% of time spent on Instagram is through Reels. As we just heard from Mark Zuckerberg, it could take, he outlined on the earnings call, 10 years until the metaverse becomes profitable. We know that Matt Miller has been absolutely smashing his Oculus gaming headset. And this year, <laughs> a new workplace headset is going to be released. Zuckerberg informing us it may actually replace traditional desktop computers in his view. Now, the end is nigh for Twitter. We'll learn about the health of the platform that Elon Musk is inheriting. But what analysts are looking at now is whether advertisers will stick around if the platform becomes this bastion of free speech that Elon Musk wants to see. Will advertisers find that un? palatable if so that will offer a tailwind to platforms like snapchat and meta platforms and after the bell we'll get results from the world's most valuable company apple as well as amazon now for apple this is set to be a record non-holiday quarter focus is going to be on those iphone sales pent-up demand the new se the iphone 13 can that mitigate rolling lockdowns in china geopolitical issues here in europe for Amazon, the legacy business is facing issues, supply chain congestion, higher prices, but the new jewel in the crown for Amazon, it's the cloud business. Amazon Web Services revenue expected to increase 35% year over year. Remember, Amazon Web Services, the market leader in the cloud infrastructure space. Yeah, and that part of the business is so well for Microsoft's so attention there. Laura, thank you very much. Plenty of tech themes to keep an eye on with Bloomberg's Laura Wright. Now, the EU is preparing its response to Russia's threat to cut off further gas supplies to Europe. Europe 
European uh, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen warned companies not to bend to Moscow's demands to pay for gas in rubles, as that would, in the view of the Commission, be a breach of sanctions. That's despite a Bloomberg News exclusive suggesting at least 10 European companies have set up ruble accounts. Let's get more details with Maria today, our Europe correspondent who joins us now from Brussels. Maria, how do you square the stance of these, well, these two different views about what would or would not break sanctions and how on earth Europe pays for gas? Uh, well, Anna, at this point, uh, you can't, and that is the issue here. If you look at what the Commission said yesterday, and that is uh, Ursula von der Leyen, who is about to speak in about an hour's time, she said, every company in Europe should follow our guidance. You should not pay rubles, stick to euros or dollars. That is, 97% of contracts are signed in a hard currency. Do not flip it, do not change it, as you risk being in breach of sanctions. But, of course, there is a gray area here around Gazprom. This is a bank that has not been sanctioned by the European Union. It is still connected uh, to the SWIFT payment system, and a lot of these transactions would be handled through their unit in Switzerland. Now, the issue here, and going back to this gray area I mentioned, is that Gazprom would set up two accounts. So, one, of course, you deposit your money in euros, and then the other one would do the conversion into rubles. But it is very clear that Russia is looking to sidestep the sanctions on the central bank. It is looking to prop up its reserves and, of course, prop up the ruble. The question is, at one point, are you legally responsible for this conversion or mm. not? We know that up to 10 companies have already set up twin accounts. And the question is, do they risk being in breach of sanctions or not? We're waiting to hear from Marcelo von der Leyen, as I said, in about 45 minutes and hoping to get some clarity for the time being right now in Europe. There isn't. And you can bet the lawyers are working overtime because the risk of sanctions, of course, is very big. I am sure a lot of hours are getting billed on this. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo in Brussels for us. Meanwhile, President Biden here in the U.S. plans to deliver remarks today on support for Ukraine. That comes as his administration looks to send Congress a proposal for weapons and humanitarian aid for Ukraine that would last through September. Jack Fitzpatrick, Bloomberg government reporter, joins us now from D.C. Jack, what can we expect the president to say later on? Well, it looks like this will be a bit of a, a preview of the more detailed request for funding that he's uh, going to send soon to Congress. There's a lot of interest in both parties in that funding request. Uh, members expect good bipartisan support uh, for a, a significant amount of money for Ukraine. And while we're waiting on the exact details, we did get a bit of a preview from the Secretary of State yesterday when Antony Blinken was talking to lawmakers about the needs. Uh, in addition to the sort of basic military and economic needs, uh, he did say he expects global food aid to be addressed. Demining is an issue they need to address in this bill because of Russian use of landmines. Uh, and at, this is a bit of a staged issue and not an immediate return, but the idea of getting U.S. diplomats back and eventually reopening the U.S. Embassy in Kiev uh, is, is something that could be addressed, uh, at least in initial stage. So there's an expectation among Democrats and Republicans that this funding bill could uh, get strong support. Probably two possible challenges. Uh, one, the House is about to leave for a week-long recess. Uh, it's it's going to have to be a, a couple weeks before they can actually process this and get it through. Two, uh, there's a possibility uh, the Democrats may want to combine this with COVID aid, uh, domestic and internationally, uh, that has gotten caught up in the Title 42 immigration debate. If this all gets melded together, it could get a lot more complicated. But there is a, a clear expectation among Democrats and Republicans uh, that a Ukraine funding bill that the president is expected to speak about would get bipartisan support on Capitol Hill. Jack Fitzpatrick of Bloomberg Government tracking those moves for us in Washington. And from D.C., we come right back here to New York. One of the biggest stories on Wall Street, billionaire Bill Wong's Archegos catastrophe was wilder than anyone knew. Now he's fighting charges that could lead to 380 years in prison. Bloomberg's Danny Berger has more on what we know and what's next. Danny. Well, yes, it certainly has been wild, Critty. Eleven charges uh, being uh, leveraged against Bill Huang. Now, he has been uh, let out on bail, as has his CFO, who is also being charged. But essentially what prosecutors are alleging here is that, one, Bill Huang built up these huge leveraged positions with money borrowed from banks, and, two, money used on swap uh, returns, which essentially also puts on leverage on this trade and does so in a way that it's hidden from the market. Now, next 
They also pumped up the prices by all this buying in a manipulative way and finally alleged that he lied to banks in order to secure more loans again to do this leverage type of buying. Now, to be clear, Bill Huang, through his lawyer, denies any of this, essentially saying uh, that he is not guilty of any wrongdoing, being alleged entirely innocent, I should say, of any wrongdoing. But the thing here that's going to be very complicated for prosecutors to prove is something that Matt Levine, uh, who wrote our big take, lays out very well is this idea that it's really, really hard to prove intent. And they have to prove intent here because it's not illegal just to buy a lot of stock, which in turn pushes up prices. I mean, Elon Musk just the other day bought a lot yeah. of stock in Twitter, which rose prices there. So it needs to be intent. And short of Bill Huang sending out a text saying, LOL, I manipulated the stock, it's going to be really tough for prosecutors, Kaylee. <laughs> Indeed, Danny. I have a feeling this saga is going to last for some time yet. Thank you so much oh, to yeah. Bloomberg's Danny Berger. And of course, as Danny mentioned, you can read today's Big Take on Bill Huang at NI Big Take Go on your Bloomberg terminal. Now let's take a look at some stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. because, of course, there are a lot of earnings movers out there, including Qualcomm, one of the big outperformers in early trading. It's up about 8% after delivering really strong guidance. Of course, it is the biggest maker of chips for smartphones, so that strong forecast kind of soothes any fears about waning demand uh, for chips in particular. Another upside mover on the back of earnings would be PayPal. Yes, it actually cut its gro uh, sales growth guidance, but maybe not as bad as investors and analysts feared that it would be and the company's pledge to really cut costs to shore up profit seems to be giving a nice sentiment lift this morning up about 3.4 percent before the bell but absolutely plunging this morning would be Teladoc this is of course a uh, online healthcare company helps with remote doctors visits things like that it cut its forecast for the top and bottom line at least one analyst downgrade a number of analyst price targets after that that stock sinking more than 40 percent before the bell Anna. That is a big drop. Coming up on today's program then, Kaylee, perfect day to talk to Jane Foley, head of FX strategy at Rabobank, as we watch the yen fall further and further against the US dollar. 130.90 is where we trade now. And later today on Ukraine, we'll hear from the mayor of Kiev. That is at 8.45 a.m. New York time, 1.45 p.m. in London. Vitaly Klitschko joins the team. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta with Kaylee Lines in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Matt Miller is off today. One of the biggest stories this morning on the macro front is going to be all the moves you're seeing in the currency space. Weakness in the euro, weakness in the yuan, weakness in the pound, and even the Japanese yen. And all of it seems to be a function of this dollar strength. Look at this. The dollar, for our radio audience, don't worry, I will explain it. The strongest in going back to 20 years, bouncing up against this level you saw in March of 2020, really when the onslaught of the pandemic kind of roiled global markets. Markets. And then it goes back to 2016, really coming off of that trade war move as well. So really, when we're talking about that stronger dollar, what are the implications here? Is this simply a question of interest rate differentials, a hawkish Federal Reserve? Is this an, uh, perhaps a haven bid? What are the implications and the read through to the exports picture and the commodities picture when a lot of this commodity demand actually has to kind of be dealt with in terms of price in dollars? Let's, po let's pose that question to Eddie Vanderwalt of the Bloomberg's Markets Live team. Eddie, something that is so striking to me is that you have this global demand for commodities. Everyone wants oil. Everyone wants food. Those contracts are priced in dollars. And when you have weaker purchasing power from a lot of these commodity importers, that doesn't exactly bode well for a lot of these companies. Your take. Really, absolutely. I think you've, you've hit on all the important talking points there. I think, you know, there is just no bad news for the dollar in these markets at the moment. Whether you're looking at the inflation story and rate differentials and the more hawkish Fed, or whether you are looking at, uh, you know, the, the, the haven bid with uh, people worried about where they're going to take their money with it, and, you know, you just end up in the U.S. dollar. I think there's, there just doesn't seem to be any bad news for the dollar. And the, the interesting question, the upshot of all of that is the, is the commodities one that you mentioned, because it's not just commodities, of course, that Americans buy, and they buy, they buy a lot of things, and they, if they buy them in dollars and they get imported, then that has a downward, puts a downward pressure on inflation, mm. right? So I'm starting to wonder whether this stronger dollar is going to take the, uh, just the wind a little bit out of that uh, inflation story that's, uh, that's been dominating markets for so long. Okay, stronger dollar, weaker yen, one of the big themes of the morning, of course, Eddie van der Velt of the Bloomberg Markets Live team. Thank you for joining us. MLIV Go, that is the function to use on your Bloomberg. If you want to get further details of the Markets Live blog, visit that function. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. The Bank of Japan has sparked a sharp side in the yen by doubling down on bond purchases. The central bank said it would buy an unlimited amount of bonds at fixed rates every business day. That prompted the yen to hit a two-decade low against the US dollar. Shares of Facebook parent Meta Platforms are soaring. Facebook's main social network added more users than projected in the first quarter. That potentially should stave off concerns that the company is losing momentum as a new generation flocks to younger sites like TikTok. And in New York, the billionaire behind the collapse of Archegos capital, Bill Quang, has been released on a $100 million bond. Quang and his former CFO, Patrick Halligan, have both been charged with fraud. Prosecutors say they scheme to mislead banks and manipulate markets. Both men have pleaded not guilty. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Chrissy Gupta and Kaylee Lyons in New York. Matt Miller is off today. Uh, and a lot of the focus today is on FX markets then, Chrissy, as we make our way through what is a generally a fairly risk-on session here in Europe, thanks to, well, in part to earnings. Yeah, and, and a lot of that is really seeping into the to, to the pre-market trade here in the United States. Futures are actually higher. A big part of this, to your point, Anna, is going to be a lot of the FX trade. 1.7% higher in futures. Ten-year yields actually not really moving a ton in terms of the volatility we've seen in the last couple of days. But it is that dollar strength that we're really talking about rising to a 20-year high. The implications for that are crucial. How much of the fund flows coming in to the stock market in the U.S. is really a function of entering the American market and therefore pushing that dollar strength. Uh, the other one you want, really want to keep an eye on, speaking of all these currency moves, is Bitcoin. If you see that dollar strength, does that also mean you see more strength into Bitcoin? And right now, the answer is yes, up 1.6%, Kaylee. All right. We do also want to mention some uh, breaking news, Creedy, coming from the Japan Ministry of Finance, an official speaking in Tokyo, saying they will respond appropriately on FX if needed. So you are actually seeing dollar yen coming off the highs of the session, though still we may remain above 130. So are we now talking potentially about FX intervention? We'll continue to stay on top of that story. As for the earnings story here in the U.S., of course, we are really in the focus of tech earnings. Meta reporting after the bell much better than expected when it comes to users, allaying some of the fears uh, around the Facebook story after, of course, the prior quarter it had lost users for the first time ever. Meta is up about 17% before the bell. You also had strong numbers out of another social media company. That would be Pinterest. It's higher by about 6%, and you're seeing a positive read through to other peers in the space, including Snap, the parent company of Snapchat, up about 5%. Twitter, no real movement yet before the bell, Anna, but of course, this is one we will watch after the bell when it reports earnings. How much do earnings really matter when Elon Musk is taking the company private anyway? At 54.20 a share. Still, though, it's trading below that deal price, 48.64, where it is this morning, Anna. Yeah, I guess he'll care, won't he, what he's buying. He'll get some further detail on that. I'm sure he's seen the numbers. Kaylee, let's have a look at where we are on the European session then. This is the picture for European equity markets up by 1.1% this morning on the Stocks Europe 600. And it is that earnings story, uh, partly the technology story from the US, but also the, the sort of homegrown European earnings story that is helping to lift things. We see strength coming through in technology. There's some M&A in there. We also see strength from the earnings in autos and in the banking sector. Crucially, more on that in a moment. Uh, we see strength in the Swedish krona this morning as well because the Riksbank, has really surprised the markets jumping into the fray with the other central banks that are hiking uh, certainly in many western markets we're seeing that put aside what we're seeing in china what we're seeing in japan it is a bit of a global theme the hiking from central banks and we've seen that now from the rix bank despite the fact they said just a few months ago uh, that they wouldn't be hiking until 2024 so a real uh, catching up to be done there on the inflation story in sweden barclays up by more than three uh, percent it seems that the trading business doing pretty well also making some market share gains that's helping to offset concern around what exactly happened with those exchange shaded uh, notes uh, that the SEC is looking into? Uh, Volvo cars up by more than 7%. Again, beating the market on the numbers they delivered, speaking positively about their ability to price, uh, to take into account those higher costs, and also talking about supply chain issues that could look a little easier in the second half of the year. Uh, on to Russian assets, and a lot of the focus is on the ruble. Uh, the Russians still want gas to be paid for in rubles, of course, and we're all looking for clarity about what exactly this means for those European businesses that want to buy the gas it's still legal to buy the gas from from Russia that is not against sanctions but exactly how that is done seems to be a real sticking point and a point of confusion Kaylee at this point Anna, yes, indeed. Meantime, we also want to get back to that breaking news out of Japan. A Ministry of Finance official speaking in Tokyo says that they will respond appropriately on FX if needed, saying that the recent FX moves warrant 
extreme concern. This is, of course, after we saw dollar yen crossing above 130 for the first time since 2002. So are we now potentially talking about intervention in the yen for the first time since 1998? Really, really interesting uh, to see these remarks out of the Ministry of Finance of Japan. Let's get more on this story now with the perfect guest for it, Jane Foley, head of FX strategy at Rabobank, who joins us now. If Japan does not outright intervene, how much weaker could the yen get, Jane? Well, you know, I think the story there is uh, very much t t dependent on what happens to U.S. yields, because that's been the big driver between uh, dollar yen. We've seen, of course, the Bank of Japan with its yield curve control policy holding down their 10-year yields on JGBs, whilst U.S. yields, of course, pushed higher in response to the hawkishness from the Fed. So at the story, the answer to your question really much lies with those U.S. yields. If U.S. yields push higher, then dollar yen will could push, push higher. Uh, but, of course, if we move into the end of the year, if people are beginning to think, well, you know, the U.S. economy could slow uh, if yields begin to turn lower. In a way, that could take the Bank of uh, uh, Japan sort of off the hook, if you like. Do you think we're seeing intervention by uh, Ministry of Finance officials here, Jane, in the market today? And just to recap the headlines that kaylee has been talking about, the, the Japanese Ministry of Finance officials saying uh, they will respond appropriately, or appropriately on FX if needed. And recent FX moves warrant extreme concern. Because when we listen to Governor Kuroda speaking earlier on in the Asia session, early in the European trading hours, he didn't seem too concerned about what was going on in FX markets and certainly seemed to be doubling down on the on the yield strategy to the expense of the yen. Well, that's exactly right. And, and that's what uh, quantitative easing, the yield curve control particularly, that's what it is doing. It is, is pressing down on the yen because of those uh, yield differentials. And that's why, in, in a certain degree, it would always be nonsense if, if the Ministry of Finance, who is in charge of yen policy, if they were to order that the Bank of Japan to intervene, because then the Bank of Japan, on one hand, uh, would be intervening to support the yen, but carrying through with this yield curve control policy, which, because of the uh, yield differentials, is, is weakening the yen. So that, in a way, makes intervention or the concept intervention at this particular point in time a little bit of a, a nonsense and, and that's why the market is expecting that if uh, the, the, the pain of yen weakness is too much for the uh, for the Japanese economy and that's because of course those input costs those commodity prices uh, that are used so much in, in Japanese manufacturing if that becomes too much to bear it's probably a, a, a some sort of change in the yield curve control policy which is probably going to be the number one Thing that the mm. Bank of Japan would do to try and, and, and push away from yen weakness. Jane, the 1998 intervention on the Japanese yen with the dollar required collaboration from American authorities as well. Can we expect to hear anything from the Federal Reserve, from the U.S. Treasury, in terms of the dollar strength that we're seeing today? Well, you know, that's a very interesting question. But, of course, you've got to remember the inflation environment that we were in just not long ago, a few years ago, for a long time. We were all in a in a low inflationary environment. And the talk was about the, 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 the chase to the bottom, that everyone wanted a weak exchange rate because of the low inflationary environment. Now, of course, uh, the boot is on the other foot. Uh, we've got uh, inflation not necessarily in Japan, where underlying uh, CPI is still very weak. But in most countries, we've got high inflation. And, and that suggests that countries would prefer a stronger exchange rate. And if you look at the policies that the Fed is following, the aggressive nature of mm. the Fed's rhetoric, it's unlikely that in this environment that the Fed is going to push away from a, a stronger dollar just yet. If, however, uh, we do start to think about a weaker U.S. Uh, uh, economy, that's when that conversation could become a little bit more relevant. Mm -hmm. Jane, the dollar is stronger not just against the yen, but also against the pound, against the euro. We saw a break of 105 on euro dollar earlier. Where do you put the odds of us reaching parity? You know, I, I still, in a way, hope that we don't see parity on euro dollar because I think if we reach parity, we are seeing some horrible news, really, in terms of the eurozone economy. And of course, we've had a taste of that horrible news this week that the market is, I think, much more seriously coming to terms with the the energy security threat, uh, particularly for Germany. And and whilst it's, it's Poland, uh, for instance, that's been in the headlines this week, uh, Poland is making signs to say it can cope. Uh, with this uh, uh, cutoff with, with supply of, from Russia. But Germany, however, you know, this is a huge industrial nation. If Germany were to go into mm. recession, which it probably would, if uh, Russian energy supply was cut, well, that would take the whole region in, into recession and have global consequences. So this is a much bigger story. Um, it's been around for a while, this, this sort of story. But I think this week, you know, this is, this is really uh, uh, coming to, home to, to, to bear. And I, I think if, 
if that news about a German uh, cutoff um, in energy does come to fruition, that's the sort of news flow that could take us to parity. But for now, mm. most forecasters are still thinking that we're going to see growth in Germany, growth in the Eurozone, that the ECB can still hike interest rates. And if that's okay. a scenario that does pan out, I think parity can be avoided. OK, we'll focus on, on the gas story then uh, for, for, for links with FX. Jane, just briefly, the Swedish krona, the Riksbank hiking just a month or so after they said that they weren't going to hike until 2024. Are there other banks around, central banks around the world that you think are also going to be wrong-footed by the pace and the strength of their own inflation? Well, if we look at the uh, at the G10, I mean, the, the, the Ricks Bank had been an, an outlier. Until recently, we did have some hawkish comments a, a few weeks ago, and the market was anticipating that they were hike in, in June. Uh, but we, we have, on the G10, turned hawkish for almost everybody now, with the exception, of course, of, of, of Switzerland um, and Japan. And, and I think they're going to be just a little bit longer. They've had entrenched low inflation really for decades, and it's going to take a lot more to, to move that. Jane, thanks so much. Thanks for joining us. Jane Foley of Rabobank, the perfect voice to have on a day when FX markets are uh, to the fore. Also to the fore, tech earnings. More on tech earnings coming up. We've had uh, a number of results already coming through. We've got many more still to come. We'll speak with Adam Chrisifuli, analyst at Vital Knowledge Media. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, Ford CFO John Lawler. That's at 8.15 a.m. in New York, 1.15 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Chrissy Gupta and Kaylee Lines in New York. Matt Miller is off today. We focus on technology then. Facebook's main social network added more users than projected in the first quarter. This helped to dampen concerns that the platform would be has been losing ground to apps like TikTok. Twitter, Amazon and Apple all report later today. Adam Crucifuli is, uh, Crucifuli is the analyst at Vital Knowledge Media for this sector and joins us now. Adam, good to speak to you. Should a stock the size and age of Meta Platforms, I know it changed its name, but Facebook, Meta Platforms, should it move by 18% on earnings? Is, is there something uh, we, we don't understand about the way that these tech names move for, for moves of that size to be so normal? Hi, thanks for having me on. Uh, it certainly is a very breathtaking rally last night and then this morning. I think it's more a function of how sentiment had, to, had been totally decimated for U.S. tech stocks uh, late last week, Thursday, Friday, and then on Tuesday of this week, you had just an absolute, um, you know, complete flush of, of very aggressive selling pressure. That created an extremely low bar for earnings, not only Meta last night, but also um, Pinterest and then PayPal as well are also higher on results that if you saw them a couple of weeks ago, you probably wouldn't have been all that impressed. But I think, like you said, the user numbers coming in have had expectations. That removed a huge concern from the Q4 report where there was uh, anxiety that people were going to exit the platform. And then they also lost less money in the metaverse business than people were fearing. And they spent a lot of time on the call just explaining how they were going to be driving overall profitability of the company. They don't just plan on spending recklessly for the metaverse. So those two items coupled with a very, very low bar and extremely negative sentiment are helping to create this uh, very healthy rally this morning in that stock. Well, of course, sentiment hasn't just been negative for Meta, Adam. It's really been negative for big tech in general. How low is the bar for other giants that will be reporting after the bell today, the likes of Amazon, which is down 17 percent year to date? Certainly. I think there's there's a lot of anxiety around Amazon, but I think people are also wondering now on the fundamental front, people are very anxious, but uh, just from a technical perspective, if, if Facebook can see this type of a rally off that type of a print, which like I said, uh, on an absolute basis was, was okay, but certainly was not perfect, then I think people, bears on Amazon are going to be a little bit nervous into the report tonight. Um, you know, there is a lot of concern around the retail part of the business. Um, if you go back to the UPS report earlier in the week, they talked about a drop off in retail deliveries towards the end of the quarter. Um, there's some concern that as consumer behavior shifts towards experiential purchases, that that will also weigh on, on the purchase of uh, hard goods off of the Amazon retail website. Um, so I, I definitely think there is a lot of anxiety around Amazon's report tonight. 
but Facebook has to be having, um, is, is certainly causing people to rethink how the stock will react. Adam, you mentioned the words consumer behavior. To what extent is Meta, formerly known as Facebook, still that beacon of what the consumer was will do and is thinking? Uh, it, it's interesting. You're seeing a lot of real secular shifts occurring in tech. So, you know, Facebook, um, you know, is losing share really for the first time in its in its modern history with, with TikTok. Um, and then as they respond to TikTok, they're also hurting the monetization of their advertisements. So it's hard to tell if this is really a reversal for the consumer overall. You know, if you listen to a Visa or you listen to Discover Financial last night, both of them suggest that they're not seeing any change in overall consumer spending and the consumer is still very healthy, but they are changing where they're spending money. So like I said, you know, travel leisure indications throughout this entire earnings season have been very, very bullish. Google and its call talked about how search activity for travel leisure extremely strong. Airlines have been talking about record revenue numbers. So the consumer is shifting towards these experiential types of purchases, and that is certainly going to show up in some of these tech company results, like so, you know, Amazon, okay. um, which obviously sells hard goods. They, they could be vulnerable. Right. And thinking of companies that sell hard goods, what about Apple? Uh, are, are there havens left in tech? And if, and if there are, is that one of them? Yeah, I certainly think Apple. Um, Apple is probably the biggest haven among the large caps in tech. Uh, Microsoft was another one. So Microsoft delivered. We'll have to see for Apple tonight. Um, you know, I think Apple. They're not. They didn't see the type of enormous run up in growth during the pandemic that other tech companies saw. So they don't have this big hangover effect as the pandemic fades. Um, they have been able historically to manage through supply chain constraints relatively well. Um, you know, in past quarters, people have become very anxious into the report, given a lot of negative supply chain data points out of Asia. They've usually managed through that pretty well, and I think they're going to do it again tonight. And then also keep in mind, they are going to be increasing the buyback and the dividend this evening as well, which they usually do with their um, with the March quarter report. So you're going to have increased capital return, and they should be able to deliver, like I said. I don't think you're going to see, um, you know, a, a big drop off in earnings momentum from the company. I think it's going to be pretty status quo for them, which is why it's been such a haven stock. Adam, thanks so much for joining us. Adam Crisafuli of Vital Knowledge Media, thank you for your time. Later today on Bloomberg Technology, an interview with the CEO of Qualcomm. That's at 5.30 p.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. After uh, the outbreak of the war, we see new cross price uh, coming up, uh, and that's obviously one of the challenges for the second half of the year. That was the CEO of Carlsberg speaking to me a little bit earlier on today. Earnings season very much to the fore here in Europe. Tom Keane joins us now to tell us what is on his mind ahead of his programmes today. And today, the FX story certainly taking a lot of the headlines. Tom, good morning. It is. It's really front and immediate in a huge day of news flow. You mentioned earnings, Apple and Amazon this afternoon, even more important after what we saw from Facebook. But, you know, what I, what I see here, Anna, is a yen that's absolutely moving where you now have Ministry of Finance jawboning on extreme concern, et cetera. And what's so important is the knock-on effects. It is not just about yen and dollar. There's lots of other knock-on effects which drive euro to a 104, drive sterling down to a very quick 124, and that's important. Tom, FX strategist, win thin among your big guests today. Who else do you have? Uh, we've got Win Thin here on Foreign Exchange. We're really efforting that story right now. But we have the chief financial officer of Ford Motor, which will be very interesting after Mari Barra yesterday. Absolutely. Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, thank you so much. Someone actually wrote in to me earlier saying Tom's definitely going to talk about standard deviations in the end today. So looking forward to those conversations coming up <clears throat> on surveillance. Now, as for what else we are watching, of course, it also is still earnings season. That's a big driver in the equity market as we continue to watch FX with great interest. Tech, more of them coming after the bell. Of course, Meta did really well yesterday. So what's the read through going to be to Twitter? And do we actually even really care about the fundamentals of Twitter when Elon Musk is taking the company private anyway at 54.20 a share? It'll be interesting to see, though, depending on the results, how 
good of a price 5420 actually looks. We'll of course also get results from Apple. It's expected to report a record setting non holiday quarter, but a lot of focus will be on the supply chain given recent lockdowns in China. Then for Amazon, if Microsoft is anything to go by AWS, the cloud business should do really well. But the question questions really surround creating its core e commerce business, which is dealing with a lot of higher costs from uh, freight and shipping to labor. So growth is expected to slow. A lot of numbers will be watching post market. Yeah, Kaylee, and when we talk about that tech, how much of it is a beacon of what's happening on the macro basis? And speaking of, I'm watching that you, those US GDP numbers coming out 8.30 a.m. How much damage did the Omicron variant do? How much inventory damage is really being done? A lot of the expectation here is that you are going to see a little bit of a slowing of growth in the first quarter. But a lot of economists, analysts saying that this is temporary. Of course, we're going to see the market reaction off of that, Anna. Absolutely. So we'll focus in on the GDP numbers. I'll keep watching what's going on with the European gas story after we saw Russia blocking exports of gas, of course, to Poland and to Bulgaria. The, the question that still hangs over the markets is will other markets, uh, other parts of Europe be next? And can we have some clarity, please, on what exactly European companies that want to buy that gas, which is still allowed by the sanctions, how they can pay for it? because they don't want to break the sanctions. They don't want to get in trouble legally. And there's a lot of lawyers, as we were hearing from Maria today earlier on, working on getting us a little bit of clarity as to what is allowed and what is not. When, he, when do you consider your debt paid? Is it when the euros leave the European bank account and arrive in a euro-denominated Gazprom bank account? Or is it when Gazprom Bank takes those and turns them into rubles? Anyway, that is the story on gas. We're also watching, though, Kaylee, uh, whether Europe will decide to follow the US lead and ban Russian oil. And that does seem to be something that, according to our reporting, the the Germans are warming to the idea of, which yeah. would be uh, at least symbolically something of a, of a step up. Warming to the idea of doing it slowly, though, and I think that's really the key. This would be a gradual cutoff of Russian oil imports, not a cold one outright. And it's interesting to contrast with some of the calls we have gotten from uh, strategists and analysts on the street. JP Morgan saying if mm. you were to see a hard stop of European oil imports from Russia, Brent could go to 185. If it's done gradually, though, that may give the market a little bit more time uh, to digest exactly what it means and for the those barrels yeah. of crude to go elsewhere like India and China. So definitely something Absolutely. we'll keep an eye on. I remember talking to that same strategist. We, we had that conversation, didn't we, with the we strategist did. who put yes. together that research report. And she was emphasizing how it will be all about the detail to link what any oil ban would do to the oil price. So we'll certainly focus on that detail for you. That is it for the early edition. Surveillance still ahead. This is Bloomberg.